I genuinely think a lot of what happens to you is a little bit of luck, stumbling across people and opportunities. I went for an interview at a sales job at the slaughterhouse. Like, this was one of my... The is selling to? Palms. When was the moment where you saw a business card where you were like, hell yeah? Probably after business cards stopped getting made. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> In this episode, we speak to Gus Tomlinson. It's a great conversation with somebody who uniquely has spent a big part of her career at one company, which is not often the case these days. But there's a moment, isn't there, where you're like, either it's the amount of money you're earning or it's the responsibility you've got but there's a time in everybody's career when you're just like yeah i speak generally faster than i think and i was always that person who did an, a maths equation and i put the answer and i never showed the working out <laughs> at school i was like this is ridiculous i know the answer in life and in work i totally now realize the importance of the working out i've been excited <laughs> to do this one because like, I know a bit about you, mm -hmm. but I don't know a lot. And you, A, you have to get used to accepting compliments from me. I know right. people don't like it, but I'm going to do it. Okay. Um, I want people like you's story that have achieved what you've achieved to be told because the people on Love Island shouldn't be celebrities. <laughs> <laughs> That's the comparison, setting the tone. Okay. Yeah, yeah, your best is the way. But I want, I want like people that are leaving school, university, and are in their career to like hear a bit how you've done it and what the story was okay. rather than so you don't want spiritual guidance which gives away the fact that i do actually watch love island clips but there we go <laughs> we'll put that Damn to it. one side sorry can we start again <laughs> <laughs> sorry so I, but i want you all like because nobody really plans what they're gonna no nope. do so mm -hmm. you are from manchester yeah near, nearby nearby yeah. Um, what was school like for you? Where, what type of school did you go to? Uh, I went to a very rural school. So uh, I would say 60% of the people who went there were from a farming background. Wow. Mm -hmm. And you're not? Um, not from a farming background, no. Um, and I would say there was school and then there was the school of my parents. Um, and my mum was uh, the bigger school that kind of, I don't know, taught me everything. School was fun. Yeah. Loads of fun. Yeah. Um, what did your mum do? What was her job? She was a sales director in an engineering. Um, so she was, um, I mean, she still sells today, even though she's, God, if she hears this, she'll kill me. But probably, she's, she's past retirement age, but she will not retire and she still sells. Um, but um, yeah, so, but she was also my main teacher in life and school. Do you think she's, do you, do you still go to her today? With problems. I do. I go to her and I go to my dad. Yeah. Um, I think the thing I quickly realised when I ended up going to school was that I had been in school since I was probably about two. I mean, I went to a maths lesson and I was like, oh, wow, this isn't a car game. This is algebra. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jill. And that was kind of my childhood into school. So school was really fun. Um, do, you, do, you think that gave you, do you think that gave you like a... Because like, for example, when I was at school... That is the most serious thing that's ever happened to me. Like anything at home was not serious and it was like at times unpleasant. Do you know what I mean? So school was like this safe sanctuary of sophistication. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was safe for me too. It was, it was less tough than at home. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. Um, I think I think a combination of the both meant I was really against failing at things. Really? Yeah. So then I assume by the time you got to like GCSEs, you're getting good grades. Yeah. And I was good. I was to the point where I came out of my maths GCSE and I cried because I thought, oh, my God, I failed it. I ended up coming like top in the year. It was it worked out magically. But um, yeah. Wow. So I was I was a total swat. So do you reckon you like when you were at school, like school was the most important? Oh, my God, thing? the most school and sport, the most important thing. What was the sport? Uh, netball. Netball. Yeah. Were you really good? I thought I was like great. Like county stuff? Oh, yeah, I did county. There you go. Um which was, I mean, it's good enough. It is? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So do you reckon when you got to like GCSE A-level sort of time, transition time, and they're starting to talk to you about uni and everything else, mm -hmm. do you reckon you had any idea None. what was coming? You what were... was coming? Um, I, I honestly, I thought more learning and... <laughs> Academia! <laughs> more learning and more booze. <laughs> um, but no idea. And I also, from selecting what to do at university and everything else in life i've never known what i was going to do next really i still don't really know what i'm going to do next yeah <laughs> wing it <laughs> seriously so so as you're finishing school the, the i find it mad 
it's in the US it's even worse, but here it's like school just drifts into uni. Yeah. And here's a load of debt and you weren't given that much insight into what you should decide that you're gonna do. Yeah, and then you're stuck doing it for three years. Yeah. So we've had other guests on here. Um Pratap Gautam, he said to me in in American university, I don't know if you know this, but you do like four or five subjects uh, for your first you couple of years. And then you major in something. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, so much better so instead much of better. literally having to pick at the age of because you're actually 17, you pick yeah. in your AS levels. Um, and if I look back, would I, I mean, I did English language at university. Um, if I look back, would I have done it? No, I'd have gone and done economics or maths or something different. Or engineering or yeah. something. Did you, um, did you get any help with the decision to do English language? Um, I got, not from school. No. I got guidance and views and things, yeah, but... Yeah. Um, I was split between art, English and maths, three entirely different things. Um, art, I figured, was never going to get me the handbags and shoes that I wanted in life. That's always been a consistent. Um, so, so, the, so the money thing, mm -hmm. like wanting to have money, I get it. Mm -hmm. Like, where did that come from? Was it not wanting to take money from your oh. parents or was it just like, I want to have um, lots of money? Like, I don't, Do you know what? I think I just like really nice things. Yeah, and good for you. Um, which is, yeah, I mean, why buy 10 things if you can buy one really nice thing and love it forever? Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a motto to live by shopping. But but, but I, I wouldn't expect that to be the thing when you're at a rural school. Like, I'd expect wellies. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, wellies I would, and that you wanted really nice wellies? Yeah. Uh, I don't know what it is, actually. I've got no idea. I just always loved nice things, yeah. always loved fashion. Yeah. Um, I mean, I was a kid that grew up watching American TV, so it was 90210 and Gossip yeah, Girl. and true. Um, the MTV era. Yeah, it really was. It was an era of music videos that we actually all watched. Yeah. Do you know, I remember getting up um, particularly early to watch the Eminem stand video before the watershed finished. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> that's dedication kids today would just not understand no, that no, as a concept no um okay cool so you so you're like you're going to it where did you so you've grown up in a rural area outside of manchester and then you did you pick a uni near home i did eventually oh, why um uh main reason was at the time i suffered with really really bad migraines and I was, a bit, I was a bit chicken and I wanted to no, stay fair. close enough to my parents. Um, also, my, my best friend at the time was going to that university, so I had the safety of her, I had um, the safety of my parents. And Isn't it mad how those things like govern really, really big decisions? Massive decisions. I know, and my actually... My mate's going there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And when I look back at it now, I'm like, oh my God, I could have gone and done a year in America, or I could have gone and... Yeah. And I would, I would approach it entirely differently. Um, but it was a big thing at the time yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, so. So what was it? Yeah. Manchester University. Manchester University. How was it? Uh, the university was great. Yeah. I had a really, really wicked time. Um, I lived with my best friend in halls, and then afterwards, <laughs> so that was that was wonderful. Um, the course was awful. Um, oh, it was English language. Yeah. What do you do in English? Like, well, forgive my naivety, but like. I had naivety picking the course as well because yeah, I it. thought <laughs> language was all going to be around how you use language to manipulate and get yeah. an outcome and emotion and going into the kind of advertising and creative side. Um, but it's more like, look at how this Terry in 1926 Yeah, exactly. Language. Believe it or not, one of my <laughs> courses was the algebra of the English language. They make maths equations on how Ooh, sentences are put together. Up. Why the yeah, maths so, ruin everything? I, I remember took, I, when I picked um, sports studies at A-level and I walked in, I was like, oh, you knobs. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. For anybody listening, don't do English language at university. <laughs> it was it was um, soul-destroying to the point where at the end of year two, I was like, oh, I, was, I was so miserable. And my parents were like, just stop, it's fine. You know. Oh, that's cool. Um, but I was like, no, I will not fail. I will finish. I will do it. Fine. Um, and I had a couple of really good people on my course that were in the same boat as me, that we'd been miserable for two yeah. years and we stuck together being miserable for the last... Um, <laughs> to get to get into debt for that. Yeah. It, I was I was actually very lucky. Um, my parents paid for my course fees. Oh, that's cool. Um, so a bit less. So I've got to say, yeah. Um, and that's actually even better that that's they were like... A, that's probably why they were like, no, nah, don't worry about it. Well, no, because the they'd, they'd already paid. Do you pay the whole lot in one, like, up front? Well, I think you committed to pay for your three years. Oh, yeah. You can't just bugger off. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
But so I was actually really fortunate. I didn't have that stress of thinking, God, I am spending all yeah. of this money. And I dread to think the way that they do it in the UK today now and making kids pay that much because the fees have tripled, I think, since I left. Yes, that sucks. It's bananas. Mm. Um, did, did you did you meet anybody at uni that's gone on to be like important in your life? Are you no. still friends with the best still, friend? Still friends with her. Do you, do you like live next door to you? <laughs> no. <laughs> Not too far though, actually. <laughs> Um, but no, still friends with her. She is a great influence on me spending money. Um, but no, I didn't actually. That's what a lot of people say I, they get from you, isn't it? Like yeah. Friends I, for life, network, whatever. Yeah, I didn't. I came out, I mean, 90% of the people who did my course went on to be teachers. Okay. Um, a lot of them were from overseas, which mm. is really depressing when you're in a room and there's probably, I don't know, 20 English people doing an English degree and we're all worse at grammar than everybody else in the room and spelling. Yeah. Um, but no, I didn't. I, I genuinely came out of university pretty uninspired. All I had was Manchester and First that helped me get job interviews. But, so you got a first? Yeah. But <laughs> Sorry. No, this, no like of failing. Um, this, thing, this thing's boring. I'm hating it. Chuck out a first. <laughs> Even if you don't like something, it doesn't mean you don't want to win. I love um, it. But, um, yeah, that's all I, I kind of came out with. I was... Yeah. I didn't make connections. I didn't I didn't find anybody. I didn't come out with a role model. I didn't... Yeah. So so when you... As it was drawing to an end, surely you were a bit like, oh, shit, what's next? Oh, massively so. I went into the spin of... Um, what are they? You know the people who put you in courses for five days to figure out what you're good, and then they chuck you at interviews. I went for an interview at a sales job at a Slaughterhouse. Like <laughs> this was who one of my. Slaughterhouse is selling to farms. They've got oh, the best. So they, yeah. Oh, so they're like. I remember that from how many years ago, but yeah. So I did all of these really <laughs> random things. So the, no, so the interview. Sorry, I need to go into this. The interview to do a sales job at a slaughterhouse. Yeah, I had to go. What did you wear this, to the interview? Yeah, with my wellies. <laughs> I actually turned up properly. It was like, that interview process was probably the only time I ever wore a suit in my life. Um, but yeah, really, I remember going and doing, it was like a weird pyramid scheme across Liverpool. And I rang my mum up and I was like, they're making me knock on people's doors. And she was like, stop, I will come and collect you. What is it? So to, to find you a job, they were like, why don't you try this? Why don't you try this? Yeah, it was, it was oh, and, and different things. Because I think when you don't know what you do, people think go into sales or go into... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's a natural thing. Yeah. Um, and I actually ended up somehow um, coming across a guy called Gary Chaplin, who's, um, I mean, I was, he's, a, he's a headhunter. He's a really successful one yeah. in the North. Um, and I was way, way down on the bottom of his type of person. But I met him for a coffee and he was like, yeah, I'll find you a job. You well, so you're, so at this point, you're like, you're doing all this random stuff. Yeah. But you got in touch yeah. with him. What did you find him on the internet? I, can't, I, I, I genuinely, I can't remember. But all I remember is... It was a good job I met Gary because otherwise I would have been selling for slaughterhouses rather than going into what was my <laughs> if first you'd job. Got a job. Yeah. <laughs> like, I just find it so strange that we've got so much structure in the school system. Oh, it's chaos. In year two, you are going to do an exam and we need a grade from you. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, see you later. Yeah. Like, you are just out in the wild. Yeah. It's bananas. Yeah. Okay. Survival of the fist. It's, it's, yeah, but it's good. So, um, so you didn't know, you didn't have any semblance of what was next. You meet Gary. Yeah. Shout out to Gary. Yeah. Thanks, Gary. Good job, Gary. Um, please send this to Gary. <laughs> um, are you still in contact with him? No, I'm not actually. Every now and then I get his emails of roles that he's recruiting for, but I've not spoken to him in a really long time. I will send this to him. I will send him this podcast. Uh, yeah, nice um, one, Gary. Um, so you meet Gary. Gary then says, I think I've got a job for you. Or was it just like, we'll try and work it out together? Yeah, no. And it was um, it was actually like a, a graduate scheme at um, a print company in Liverpool. So again, not a very exciting industry, but mm. they were part of the Bertelsmann Group. And it was like, right, okay. Yeah. Um, what was the job? It was Solutions Development Executive. Wow. Which basically meant I got to look around this company try loads of things so I spent time with people in finance in production we went do you know that they this is probably quite boring for everybody but they actually use diamonds to engrave on the cylinders to 
print magazines and newspapers. So I've known that diamonds are the hardest material. Yes. And they've been used in drill. They used get used in yeah. drill bits and all sorts of So they of stuff. use them on the when they design their Hello or the OK magazine yeah. and they're scratching it all out before they put the ink on. They use diamonds. That is a good fact. Yeah, so there we go. Um, and so I did loads of little bits and my job was to figure out how to make print cooler by using scented ink, putting QR codes and creating a revenue line that was a bit more sustainable for an industry that was ultimately dying. So it's almost like, it's a little bit like a grad scheme. Yeah, it's, it, that's exactly what it was. So he just knew that there was a pathway at yeah. the company and thought, actually, yeah. you go and have a... And because they were a German company as well in the UK, they yeah. didn't have anything formal. So it was the opportunity to get UK people into that. Epic. Yeah, it was great. What, so when you when you walked in day one, because you'd been knocking on doors and doing other random stuff, did you have any high hopes? My only high hope was that it was actually going to be an office, which it was. I mean, soon dashed because I was actually in a factory and I didn't see daylight from nine till half five because I didn't have a window and I looked over a factory floor. So it wasn't that great. <laughs> yeah. But oh, I worked with such a great bunch of people. Yeah. Um, and it was a big company, but um, do you know, it was full of people who really cared yeah. Um, nice people took yeah. their time, taught me loads. There was we had a German finance director who taught me finance. He that's equated a good, it's to a good nationality yeah. finance director yeah. to learn from. Yeah. He equated it to pizza, which made it very, very understandable for me. Um, our CEO at the time, a guy called Richard Law, which was like could have been really scary, really nice. Really? Took me into board meetings. Worst thing, oh, we did a presentation to B and Q. And part of being, he was called California Shutters. Yeah. I did the slide. It said California Shitters. <laughs> I presented that to them. It was, it was terrible. Um, uh, sorry. But, so, yeah. so you're in the meeting. Yeah. So you created the presentation. And I put the slide up and, and I the... see, oh, crap. There is an you awful, say, oh, crap? <laughs> awful, awful typo in here. I mean, I'm obviously beetroot red at the moment. Uh, everybody who knows that I did an English language degree but can't spell is ro are rolling their <laughs> eyes at me. Um, How did they react? Oh, they actually, it was great. And they ended up to go and buy from us. It broke the ice. I'm yes. taking it as, yeah. yeah. People don't care. Like, mistakes are no. fine. No. So how many how many people were on the um, or on that, like, scheme? Was it like a revolving oh, it was me. door? No, or was it... at the time. So it was, a, it was more across Germany and they just plonked me into it. Um, oh, and wow. I think they actually took people continuously after that. But yeah. That's super fortunate. Yeah. I, I genuinely think a lot of what happens to you is a little bit of luck, stumbling across people and opportunities. 100% yeah. from a place of zero credentials. Yeah. <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's just a thing. And, and the, do you know what? This has been, um, this has been fascinating because we've had people like, like Emma Lindley and we've mm. had Jeff and, and all these people didn't have any idea no. what they were going to do. Like Lisa Scott, the CEO at Bank, she was like, she wanted to be a quantity surveyor. Like, bit of a difference yeah exactly and it's just yeah it's mad um so <clears throat> did you did you like did you do that time there and within the different areas that you're in think actually this is the one that i think excites me the most because you had quite a broad role like the solution mm -hmm. type role i liked the solving problems yeah i think that's there um i can't say there was anything that drew me to it so i liked solving problems and i liked making the company money so two things. I loved interacting with customers. I liked thinking of ways to create new things. And I really liked the fact that this company was on a downward trajectory and how could you prolong it and get growth back. That did you get, did you get paid anything on that upside? No, not at the time. Okay. Although um, I do remember the one bit I didn't love about the time was probably my boss. Um, but I do remember doing a really good job after I think I'd been there about 18 months and um, I got pay rise, which was like, wow, the CEO gave me a... He, gave me a printed letter, came into my office, knocked on the door, gave me this letter, and I was like, oh, this is amazing. Did you keep the letter? Do you know what? I don't think I did. That's a shame. I don't think I did. I have got a letter from um, another CEO at some point where he wrote, at some point, I will make sure that you get a P&L management. Oh, wow. So I've, I think I've probably got that one in a notepad somewhere. But yeah. So like, I remember the first time I got any sort of pay rise and when the pay comes in at the end of the month and you oh, look in your banking app, amazing. you're like, whoa, there's spare. Yeah. Yeah. So unfortunately, my parents had kicked me out by that point, so I was fending for myself. But yeah. still, yeah, it was amazing. So <clears throat> when so increased responsibility, how long did you stay at that? I business? think I was there three years. Okay. So when you arrived, you were, Maybe what was the title again? 
Solutions Development Executive. I went on to an even cooler. Go on, then. What was the title by the time um, you finished? No. So it was Solutions Development Executive or Manager when I left there. And then I went to be a commercial regulatory executive. Wow. I know. So a different firm, commercial regulatory executive. GBG. That's where I joined. Is that straight out of job one? Yeah. How did that come about? Um, Gary again. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. <laughs> um, Gaza. <laughs> knew a lady and basically went, rang me up and said, look, there's a job. Um, it's in Chester where you grew up. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you'll get to travel internationally. Do you fancy going and chatting to them? And I was like, yeah, why yeah. not? Yeah. Um, print is probably still definitely going to die. So at some point, this isn't going to work out. Um, and I went to Chester for the interview and they made it sound so exciting. Um, it was it was great. I had the first interview with a lady called um, Alexi. Had another interview with a guy called Glenn, who I then went on to work for. And I came out of that interview thinking I'd absolutely fluffed it. Really? I think I rang my mum again and was like, mum, I've not got a job. What do you reckon you messed up? I, in the end, I didn't. He just had such a poker face. Oh, because you didn't get any feedback yeah. from him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and afterwards, I remember like six months later being like, oh my God, it was the scariest interview. And he's like, you did great. You were amazing. And I was like, oh, I did not get that vibe. Do you, reckon that's, do you reckon that's partly because at the place you were at before, there was such a, like, friendly vibe? Yeah, maybe. And do you know so what? It, GBG had has got an insanely friendly vibe. Mm. Um, and so did Glenn. I think he was just trying to see how I could handle what, an yeah, interview, really. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, so, yeah, then I joined. I was so excited I was going to go and travel internationally. Um, and I spent the first year reading every single data privacy and AML regulation in countries that we wanted to expand into decide to decide if they were a good idea. Do you think that that comes from uh, the job you had before, where you just had to learn everything and you weren't really told? Because that's, that's, that's not a typical habit. No. Or is that your mum? Like, Do you know what? It probably is. Yeah. It's probably been drilled into me from such an age. Um, just automatically looking yeah. for AML book lists. Yeah. <laughs> Google Translate being my best friend. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but, and I remember, I just like, oh God, why have I taken this job? I mean, I'm not a lawyer and I'm literally spending my life reading legal documents. Um, but I look back now and it's probably one of the, if anybody has got the time, which they probably don't in the identity industry anymore, mm. to, to learn the foundations. Yeah. Oh my God, it made me make decisions quicker, yeah. understand, talk to customers in a totally different way. Uh, it was just really boring at the time. So what year was this? Oh, I don't know. I've been there 10 years in November, so 2014. 2014. Wow. Yeah. Did I, one of the questions I always ask people is, um, when was the moment where you saw a business card where you were like, hell yeah? Oh, God. <laughs> Probably after business cards stopped getting made. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> but there's a moment, isn't there, where you're like, either it's yeah. the amount of money you're earning or it's the responsibility you've got. But there's a time yeah. in everybody's career, I refuse to accept that there isn't one, when you're just like, Oh, yeah. I think it was probably when I became head of data. One thing I learned really quickly, so I've never known what I've wanted to do. I've always known what I've loved. Okay, and what's And when that? I spent, I love solving problems with data. I love it. Okay. I think the power of it is is wicked. And there's not that many problems that you can't solve by understanding data and applying it to something. Um, so after I'd read all of these regulations, I then went and started sourcing different data to put into our platforms to make it grow. Um, and it was... Honestly, I look back and whenever we interview people for those roles today in the company, probably my favourite ever role. Um, it was so fun. It was all about driving things forward. You're buying and selling at the same time. Yeah. You're going into... At the time, we were talking to uh, Stripe, Holvey, Coinbase, all of these companies who we had to, at the time, explain to our CEO, who they, our CFO, who they were because they were brand new names going back oh, 10 yeah, years. They course. weren't really the household names that we knew, but they all wanted to expand globally. And it was right at that breaking point of international explosion. Um, Amazing. So I had a ball. I had an absolute, it was brilliant. And I, I went from being commercial data manager to head of data. Um, and I got to build up a team. And that head of data role was like, yeah, do you know what? Yeah. Love it. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. It, it's um, How different was the transition from a company that was on decline to a company that was cheating up totally different do you, do you think it was different because of the just the the general environment because people were aware of the fact that it was declining 
prior and the one you're in now is going up? It was a different mood. I'd say there was also just totally different opportunity. Yeah. So you went from um, people fighting in consolidation and pressure to the opportunity. And we were the only international IDB player. The day I walked in to the company, we were acquiring a business in APAC. And at the time, uh, our MD of the identity side of the business, brilliant, brilliant guy, actually, went, you. I was like, oh, me. <laughs> he was like, what do you think of this? And I was like, I'd been there for a couple of weeks and I got to give my opinion on something. Yeah. Um, I had no idea at the time it was an acquisition because I wasn't on an insider list, but um, I got to see things. And then in the time from going and doing all of this research, building all of this data in, we'd acquired like three or four companies and I'd been on the due diligence or the presentation team or the different things. And you like that opportunity was inset. I was literally sponging up as much information as I could and what an organization full of wicked people yeah. who put their trust in people and actually gave them that opportunity to do it. It was, it was, I was very, very lucky. Do you think that's the time that has the company been like that since? Um, it's continued to grow and give that opportunity. I think, um, it's got a lot bigger. There was 200 people. There's 15, it's still not a massive company. There's 1500 people now, mm. but the opportunities that get created within it, they're awesome. Yeah. Um, was there anybody else that joined at a similar time that had a similar attitude like can do and has ended up being somebody who's now in the leadership as well um there's do you know what there's so many talented people that joined there was um we used to have these pizza lunches so if you joined you got to have a pizza with the ceo who at the time at sushi while well, we ate pizza um no but come on. no it was <laughs> i think we probably could have but we had the pizza um <laughs> and uh, there was a lady called um, Anne-Marie and she's gone off to lead a sales team in um, part of our European business and has had absolutely massive results. Um, I worked on a team uh, with a guy called Max who's just been promoted to be our sales director for Europe and he's had a massive um, career trajectory. So there was lo loads of opportunity within GBG. There's lots of good people that joined and also left along the way. Yeah. Um, but... Uh, at the time, I kind of did data for the international side of the business and there was a lady, Kate, who did it for the UK side of the business. Um, she's gone on to be our um, chief data protection officer, um, taking us through some absolutely massive challenges and expanded everything globally. Um, so it's such an amazing thing. Like, it's, obvi it's obviously in the company's DNA to bring people in and grow them. Yeah. Is that fair to say? Yeah, massively so. Do you think that's... Like it's you know it's not a new company, so it'd been trial and tribulation. But do you do you often hire senior leaders? So it's funny we for a, for a long time we probably didn't, and then four years ago um, we bought in a number of senior leaders yeah. um, to probably take us to the next level yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, so we had a change in a CEO seven years ago, uh, and we've actually just recently changed. But interestingly, internally. Yeah, he um, ran your APAC business, APAC, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, but again, awesome that we've taken somebody internally and put them in that position awesome. to take us to the next part of growth. Um, but we we had... So um, Dev joined us at that time. Um, Boris joined us in the EMEA business. We had a regulatory officer who kind of took us to the next level of thinking on risk regulation and legal. Um, but there's also been a huge amount of... This year, we've just... I mean, we're nearly at the end of our financial year, but I think we've had something like 30 promotions uplifting talent into really see, you know, key roles. It's it's wicked. Yeah. And I think there's a little bit of a mentality of pay it forward. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because the people that are making those decisions now are people that yeah. were promoted, as you're as yeah. your testament to. Um, Love it. It's, yeah. it's an amazing... Like, yeah, I, I prefer that to, like, the revolving door at the top of the business because yeah. it just doesn't work. And do you know what? There is... Most people stay for a, for a long time. Yeah. There's a lot of talent and expertise. There's a lot of new talent that we've brought in, yeah. um, especially actually across product and tech, um, which is where I spend a lot of my time. But um, a lot of really good people um, that you continue to see different iterations and versions of. Um, there's not, it's not like everybody's been there and has gone quite stale. Yeah. It's a, it's a fresh environment and yeah. people change, which is nice. Could, could you do me a favour? Yeah. Could you give me two definitions of GBG? Ooh. Could you give me one definition that somebody who is not in our industry would understand? Mm -hmm. And could you give me the the corporate spiel? 
Yeah. Because <laughs> they're two different things, right? So I'll give you an example. I'll do it first. I haven't thought about this, and I'm going to mess it up now. So, <laughs> so detective, somebody who has no idea what it is, yeah. is if you sign up to a neobank, mm -hmm. it scans your face and it goes, here's a card, that's super easy. Mm -hmm. But if you try and do that for a business account, it's crap, we've made it good. Yeah. I can just say that we're the really easy part of it. Um, <laughs> so I'll kind of give a few different versions. When I, about GBG and then about me, when I talk about GBG, we're almost like the invisible heroes. So the digital economy doesn't work unless you've got GBG behind it because Ooh, nobody punchy. can open a bank account. Nobody can buy a, buy a car. Nobody can do anything that's got a significant monetary value without having a GBG behind it. A GBG in that it could be somebody similar to... Yeah. G fine, okay. Um, but we say, is this person real? Yeah. Can you do business with them and can you trust them? Yeah. So in a world where, imagine we're doing this podcast and I've got no idea that you're actually a, a decent guy, <laughs> how do I immediately understand those three things? And it has to be immediate because time is our our most precious precious commodity as people. Yeah, fine. So, so from a like a consumer perspective, mm -hmm. like let's say, I don't know, my mum or my nan or what yeah. or whatever. How would like when would they experience GBG? They obviously wouldn't experience it, but when would they know that GBG is involved? What sort um, of thing? If I say Grand National, it's coming up. Yeah. How many people on Grand National Day? It could even be your nan want to open a betting account yeah the day that they can open that betting account or the moment they open that betting account they've experienced gbg the beauty of it is they don't know that gbg are behind it because nobody wants to know fine so we're, so we're saying that the companies that we interact with in those sorts of scenarios yeah. are using a gbg using gbg behind to, they have to to make sure that they know gus tomlinson you're a real person yeah you're over 18, you're not on a sanctions list, yeah. thankfully I'm not, um, and I can trust you. Actually, you're a decent person, you're not going to take money from my business, commit fraud, etc. Yeah. Um, so then, like, size of the business, mm -hmm. just because um, it, you can talk about it, right? Yeah. It's a public company. So how many people, how much money does it make? Like, what's the... So there's about uh, 1,200 people across three regions. Yeah. So... Um, We've got the chunk of them actually in the UK. Um, then we've got a big team in North America yeah. um, and a team in Australia and APAC. Nice. Um, money, and we actually, really importantly, we've got two kind of sides to our business. We do identity and fraud and we do location. Yeah. Um, a third of our business is location, two thirds of it are identity, and we're about 300 million. Round up. Jeepers. When we, when did you um, when did you realise you were going to be important to the business? Oh, that is a tough question. Um, when I started making a difference to things, so um, it's really I've amassed loads of knowledge about identity fraud. There's there's naturally by having years of doing it. Um, and I used to think that that was the most important thing to the business, but actually getting knowledge is really easy. Mm. Um, I think it was when I started making decisions around our, what we were going to do with data in the future um, that I probably added more value yeah. um, and started driving and making an impact. Um, it's fascinating, isn't it? Because as you go through your career, there's always an imposter syndrome when you get massive. to serious yep. levels. Do you say, would you say you suffer with that? Sometimes, yeah. Yeah. I think everybody you does. Sh you should, actually. Like people say, oh, I don't suffer from imposter syndrome. You're either just really cocky or you're not self-aware. <laughs> <laughs> or you haven't got to a level that deserves imposter syndrome, like, quite frankly. Um, so so you've suffered with that, but like the, the, like I say, you got to a time when you're like, actually, do you know what? I'm a part of this. Because yeah. in your, early in your career, you're like, I'm working for the company mm -hmm. and the company pays me. But then, like you say, there's this, there's this point in time where you're like, this company... There's a, there's a genuine exchange of value. Yeah. It's not just like salary for time. It's like I'm actually giving the company more than just my time and ticking boxes. Yeah, because I think, I mean, I genuinely believe we can create something awesome. Yeah. And being a part of that is pretty special. Yeah. There's one thing I could never do sitting in the print industry was thinking you could change the world because if you get Hello Magazine into people's hands, it's not the most life-critical <laughs> thing. Exactly. Um, 
I've got a huge belief and I think it's probably one of the reasons that I love GBG so much is that we can make the world a better place. Mm. So granted, getting paid is is wonderful. Um, having a team, hitting goals, doing all of that. But if you can help somebody who is new to country or a homeless person on the street yeah. or anybody get access to a service, that's pretty cool. It's very cool. If you can help stop the divide between the Western world that is digitally active and wealthy versus not, mm. that's pr that's pretty cool. It's really cool. Do you also, um, do you feel as though you got even better at your job when you crossed that bridge? Yeah, because you love it more. You're yeah. passionate about it. And happy wins. I always yeah. say this, happy wins. When you're happier, um, you're better at what you do. Yeah, and I think you've got, I don't know, something just, we created, four years ago, we tried to articulate why, data was really important and we had a stab at it we worked with an agency we probably spent a bit of money trying to do it and then we did it again last year and we created something called the identity index and i look at that and the team that created it we were all in it mm. we all believe we can all see we all felt the difference and the outcome that we created as a result of it was awesome and it's starting to make a difference do you feel as though um compared to four years ago when you tried to do that and last year do you feel as though employee onboarding has been more successful since you've had that stuff done right? I think increasingly people are joining more for what we do rather than the job role. Exactly. Um, and actually we've got a really great head of talent in GBG. And when I listen to her explain GBG now and why you should come and work for us, Oh my god, it's miles away from the pitch I had, which was come and you can get some international travel and it'll be fun. Well, for you though. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it did, <laughs> but and it's way, way more important for people starting their career now, particularly younger people, to understand why they're turning up. Vital. Um, and actually, when we're getting talent from the market and from competitors working for a company who's got a really clear purpose, yeah. is a differentiator because yeah. people have sat and been on the kind of hamster wheel of. I'm here, I do my job without yeah. knowing what they're creating and contributing. So yeah. I think that there does is, make a There is merit in yeah. doing that stuff. Huge right, merit. For sure. And it gets harder as you get bigger as well, right? Mm. Like for us, I can just talk about it. And if people see stuff online, they're like, okay, we see. But when you get bigger, it's hard yeah. to lock in the message. Um, what's your job? Uh, I am chief product officer. So I look after all of the products for identity and fraud globally. Um, How many people are in like your org? Ooh. Roughly. About 70-ish. Amazing. And but it's 70 people that are like proper doers. It's not like... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's real. Um, Amazing. Yeah. How does that make you feel? Um, lucky when I look at the team because they're all... Yeah. I've got... I mean, there's some really great talent in there. Yeah. Um, it's a sense of responsibility. Yeah. That's a difference as well when you switch from actually being self-successful to helping everybody else be successful. Quarterback style. Um, yeah, quarterback yeah. style. <laughs> um, do you ever? But, do you ever? Do you ever? Um, do you ever just step back from it a little bit? And I do it sometimes as well because, like, <laughs> I, can't, I can't believe I'm doing all this nonsense. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> like, it's mental. And I sometimes sit there and I'm like, oh shit, like I'm doing this thing. Do you ever? Do you, do you reckon you ever take? Take a breath. Is that when you chose to get a neon sign made <laughs> when you took a breath? It's like, do you know what I'm missing? Yeah. Um, but do you ever, <laughs> this do you completes me. Yeah, it um, does. But do you, do you reckon you ever take a breath? Or did you, when it just happened, like when you got that title, you're like, oh, okay, cool. No, I did, actually. Yeah. Um, I did. And I think I probably wouldn't if the person who actually at that time gave me the title and the team around me made me take a breath. Really? And How I would shoot of them. Yeah, and I would say actually, if I, I've worked for some great people. Yeah. I, I I hit the jackpot on managers. Yeah. Um, if I look at something that I really learn and remember that actually had an impact on me, it was when you give somebody a job that is important, make them feel it, because actually at that moment in time you probably don't do it yourself. You're so excited and you're like, what's next? How do I do it? Oh my god, how do I do the first ninety days, etc rather than actually just taking a breath and saying, oh, yeah. It, that is ama that's an amazing piece of advice. Because you're right. People just, they feel the pressure of the new yeah. responsibility rather than to sit in it for yeah. a little bit. And I'd actually say, if you A-B tested, mm -hmm. 
people that got big jobs and didn't and people that got big jobs and did, I reckon you'd see more success. Probably. Because they've taken a breath and just thought, okay, cool, like soak this in a little bit. Yeah. And I think sometimes that taking a breath is just really important anyway. Um, And I mean, I speak generally faster than I think. And I was always that person who did a maths equation and I put the answer and I never showed the working out. Yeah, and when I look back <laughs> at school, I was like, this is ridiculous. I know the answer yeah. in life and in work. I totally now realize the importance of the working out. And actually, if there's one thing that is useful of maths lessons, it's that yeah. because that's how you bring people along with you. That's how you do. It. But it's also how you can look back and say, this is how I got here. How can I be better for the next chapter? Yeah. And if you get stuff wrong. Yeah. You know how to. You know where it went wrong yeah. as well. Do you know there's a guy called um there's a guy called Jeremy Balkin, he's one of our investors, and he um he set up a business called uh Today Pay, which is instant refunds mm -hmm. for merchants. And he was the global I need to get him on the pod actually, he was global head of innovation for payments at JP Morgan. The guy's in, like nice achieved these amazing <laughs> things. And he messaged me yesterday and he just sent me a picture of the beach and he was like, I've just had to take a couple of days because I can't think properly with everything that's going on. Yeah. Like I need to just decompress. Do you do you decompress? Because you've got a lot on. Like, you've got yeah. big responsibility, big pressure, big job. Do you ever, like, slow down and take a minute? Well, when I watch Love Island. Um, no, <laughs> I'm joking. I genuinely, I don't. Please don't judge me, everybody. Do I don't watch Love Island. You watch love um, it. <laughs> I, so it's funny. My, um, my boyfriend is the total opposite of me as a person. Um, if it wasn't for him, I probably wouldn't. Okay. Um. But I have a day that is clear at a weekend and I hike or we do something. Yeah. And that actually regularly, that the weekends where I work a Saturday or Sunday or I don't switch off, you notice it. So I think that the personal time you have in your life is really important. Um, I run most mornings. Yeah. Um, that's a, a switch. I think you've got to kind of create that frame of when you're on and when you're off. Yeah. It's very difficult to switch off for you in particular. I mean... I'm also we're also in very different positions you you are driving it it's you you're the guy <laughs> yeah it's and it's yeah like I wake up at three in the morning and I'll check my emails yeah and I know it's bad but there is no option but for this company to succeed true there is but no do you option. need to be looking at your emails at 3 a.m no, to no make purpose, it succeed it, it serves no purpose it has no utility it's moronic yeah but it's really bloody difficult to yeah it is to not do so like I've got my framework as well, you know, my training, yeah. my time off, um, increasingly focused on my child, you know, all that sort of yeah. stuff. She's helped. Um, but it's hard. Like it's really hard. Speaking of hard <laughs> in like, it sounds like it's all been roses. The GBG story, you know, beautiful. If it has, it has. Are there any times that have been particularly tough um, on that, on that rise? There's been times I mean. Every time I've had a new job, I've spent six months probably thinking, am I qualified for it? Yeah, which is good. Um, it's hard, but it's good because yeah. it checks you. Um, there's been, I mean, the general economies made things a little bit more difficult and made people reassess things. Personally, probably fortunate to say no. Good on you. Um, good on you. I think it's good on me, but I genuinely think it's good on a culture and the people that are around you. Yeah, I, I get that sense. Um, I, I, I can't stress enough. I've never been, I've never sat still long enough to get bored and the company's never put me in a position where I felt yeah, bored. Yeah. So that's really important. I've never felt like, um, the first, I, I was literally, I was probably 27 with a load of 45, 50 plus people. I never felt like that. Nobody ever made me. So I never had a challenge. Mm. It's, I've been fortunate. GBG has created an environment, actually, that makes the hard fun. The hard should be fun. Yeah. And I think you work hard, you play hard. There's, there's satisfaction, there's reward in it. Yeah. Um, and doing it as a team. Oh, if you're team the only person to... finding something hard, that sucks. Yeah. If there's 10 of you finding something hard, it's a team challenge and you get there. Yeah, I like that. Um, I think that's that's quite a good thing. And that Yeah, it, it feels as though you've found these things that, make it not be shit hard yeah because there is good hard yeah there is, and I, I think that's exactly the thing it's good hard i mean 
yes, there's always hard work. I also think it's a state of mind. Yep. If you go into something thinking this is going to be really hard, it's impossible. Or Misery I'm, likes company. Yeah, you're not <laughs> you're not in it to solve it. So I think there is a little bit of, yeah, it is, it is tough. But yeah. if I think of it as being tough, I'm probably not going to be my best in that. Fact. Yeah. Yeah, you can do anything you want. Like, yeah. you can do anything. Almost. Um, <laughs> We're trying. Um, industry prediction. Um, so an industry prediction in... In a couple of years' time, four or five years' time, whatever, what's the industry prediction in the world that you're in and we're mm -hmm. in and whatever that you think is going to have the biggest impact on us as people day to day? What's the one you think we're going to notice the most? Um, that's a really great question. A really tough question, but a really great question. Um, I think we will see less and less of tech in the front of our face. Um, it's, I think the, the challenge is to make everything that is not value add to the consumer entirely invisible. Yep. Um, I'll give you a really good example today. Anybody who goes onto their bank, they have to spend five minutes learning about scams. Yeah. That's irritating. And that's because actually things aren't compensating for it. Mm-hmm. I think in the future, everything has to be invisible. And I think we'll get to a point of that. It, yeah, I agree. It will also get invisible because we won't have devices at some point. Potentially. And we could be... The, I mean, as soon as we start to get, whether they be sunglasses or whatever it is that's next, yeah. um, you could go really wild and say, we're all going to be chipped. <laughs> yeah. Who knows? Yeah. yeah. There's lots of... I'm, I'm, I'm more of them... If there's lots of people who would sit in my seat as a chief product officer of an identity company and say, digital identities, yeah, everybody will own their identity, everything. And um, I'm not actually a huge believer of it. Yeah. Um, I think that is a little bit of the impossible. And I think we put a bit too much weight on consumers caring that they want to own their identity. Yeah. If they'd like the convenience that it derives. Exactly. But do they want the responsibility correct. of doing it? Yeah. Um, That's interesting. I th what I like about um, like the way you think, but also the prediction you've made is you're actually thinking what what makes it better for consumers. And then, yeah. like you said, GBG will or a GBG will be behind all mm -hmm. of that, but won't necessarily interfere. It just makes everything quicker and yeah. easier. Fascinating. Um, that actually takes us to time. Oh wow, that went really quick, doesn't it? I didn't I say there that. You go. Um, thank you. That Thanks was great. Very much. That was great fun. And that concludes another episode of Not What I Expected. I hope you loved that as much as I loved recording it. If you like it, let us know. If you don't, tell us how you think it could be better. Thanks and see you again.